you know, we study science, some of you guys are studying um, Einstein, for example. Einstein, he believed in a God, which I've talked to you about before, that he believed in a, a Spinoza's God. Spinoza's God is like, he created the universe, made everything, and his quote really was, he believes in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with the fates and the actions of human beings. Last week, alhamdulillah, we had a very nice discussion after the lecture and the discussion, and people opened up about their problems of life and about issues and, and things we all go through all the time. You know, this is normal. What was very important is, compared to what Einstein believed, Einstein believed God left you alone and you have to take care of yourself. But Islam teaches, no, Allah is with you. Allah says, Allah is closer to us than our jugular vein. He's never abandoned us. You know, brother was asking, well, what about the unbelievers? Allah never abandoned them either. He's always with them and helping everybody in this world. The believers, of course, get some special benefits because you're on the side of God and against those who are against the truth and being good on this earth. So, something important in this ayat of Kursi, Allah says, Sinatum wala nom. He doesn't sleep, nor he takes rest. He's always there. Which is very contrary to what you may learn and say, some of you have gone to Catholic schools. It says in Genesis, and it's also in Exodus, that God says that He created the universe in six days, and the seventh day He rested. That's why Sunday is the day of rest. And it was funny, I was just speaking to uh, one sister yesterday, she teaches in the Board of Edu teaches in Toronto, a, a part of the Board of Education in Toronto. And something beautiful that they do is they want the teachers to be aware of the different views of religion for everybody. So they take the teachers to the masjid, to a Hindu temple, to you know, a church, a synagogue, so they get to know the religions of other people. So they went to the, the Hindu temple, and it was funny because she was telling us this, but I was laughing, but at the same time there's something serious behind this. So she says, they went to the Hindu temple, and I think they call it a mandir or something like that, and they couldn't go and visit their religious area. And they said, why? What happened? He says, well, we put the gods to sleep. They're sleeping. They're taking their afternoon nap. <laughs> they said, well, we're just teachers. You know, we're just trying to understand and knowledge. No, no, you can't disturb their sleep. Leave them alone. So she jokingly tells the, her Christian uh, teacher also was with her. She said, well, what if I need God and he's sleeping? You know, I'm not going to worship a God who's sleeping when I need him. And then, funnily, she said, well, God rested on the seventh day. The Christians said, well, God rested on the seventh day, so we, we have the same problem, right? No, we don't. In Islam, God clarifies everything. He says, look, I don't get have fatigue. Slumber doesn't overtake me. I don't need sleep. He's present everywhere. He's never abandoned us. It's not like human beings who need rest. Now, what is rest? Okay, it's very animalistic. It's very it's for humans. Our muscles relax. We our consciousness comes down. You know, actually, I looked it up. I says, what is it? What is the translation in the in the in the dictionary of rest? It's impossible to think that God needs sleep. Sleep is a condition in which muscles are relaxed and the consciousness is suppressed by natural factors in the body. God doesn't have a body. He doesn't need rest. He's the one who created this universe. And if you think about it, one second that God abandons the universe, the universe will crumble. So He's there keeping it going and He's always there with us, never abandoning us. So, it's important to understand that He doesn't rest. He's always with us and He's there for us. And when we have our problems in life, how could we not turn to Him? He's there for us to, to such a point that it just will shake you when you realize it, how much is there with us. I know when I was a teenager, I started reading the Quran and it changed my life. Because I felt that, you know, I understood God. At least from my minute level. And I began to feel His presence because He was helping me in all my questions, in all my problems. He was there for me. So, it's a personal experience we have to experience. I cannot jam it down to someone's throat, but at least I can say, you know, I felt it. I woke up. And I'm still trying to come out of this darkness. That's why that ayat is so important to me. 
Allah took me out of the gutter and says, look, I'm here for you. I'm never going to leave you. In your problems, come to me. He says, Ad -uni as Ask me and I'm there for you. But how many of us remember him? We're always in our worries. And then in the end of the, this ayat, it says, And the preservation of them both tires him not. And he's the most high and the great. So he doesn't get tired. Now within this ayat, a lot of people say that intercession is not something that Muslims believe in. Or it's not something that's accurate. Well, we've covered that in our discussions. We know intercession is there. Because Allah says, um, if you look at this uh, ayat al Kursi, who can give me the verse? Shafa. Man dalladi yashfa indu illa biyadi. Who can intercede with Allah except by God's permission? So God is saying, I will give permission to some. And who are those some? The purified ones, the great prophets, those who are very of piety and taqwa. And those are the examples in the Quran, for example. So and you, if you know that Allah showed us through Prophet Adam, telling us the angels bowed through Prophet Adam to show us, look, angels, go through Adam to come to me. We've talked about that. So there is intercession. And there is intercession throughout the Quran. But for us, there are different versions of intercession. One, if you look at all of the creation of God, everything, there are two types of intercession. One is the, the creative causation as well as the legislative intercession. Now what is this creative causation? Every cause intercedes with Allah for its effect. So if something wants, like say water, what is water's creation of God? But it needs Allah's help to, to be there for us, to, to quench our thirst. Allah's with us in every way imaginable. He's, he's not the Spinoza God that forgets us. Like a guy who car, car, make, car manufactures to make a car, and says, okay, now it's up to you. You come back to us when you need us, but it's up to you. No, God is saying, I'm with you wherever you are. I've never abandoned you. So if you look at the different ayats of Quran, there is intercession. And the system of cause and effect is found in intercession as well as in prayer. And if you think about this intercession, which is a cause and it intercedes with us with Allah, how could we not ask those to pray for us who are very of, of good nature? How could we not ask the Prophet to pray for us? You know, people say, well, he's dead. Well, why, do, why do we say, salam alaikum to the Prophet? Doesn't, don't we want him to pray for us and say, alaikum salam, may the peace of God be upon you? Of course. So this ayat, of course, he clarifies all the, you know, the, some of the issues we have, intellectual issues. One time, in continuing this ayat, one time someone had asked Imam Jafar Sadiq about the words kursi. Zayatul so kursi means throne or like a chair. <laughs> what does that mean in terms of Islam? What does it encompass, this, this kursi? Kursi, Imam Jafar Sadiq said, it includes everything in its throne. This whole universe, it's this kursi, meaning his throne, his, his chair. Not meaning physically, but it's encompassing all of his creation. So, when you think of what Allah is trying to tell you, He says, I am in control of this whole universe. I am there for you. I am there for the ant under the dark, not in the dark, not under the rock, in the ground. I am there for the fish. I am there for the sun. I am there for the moon. Without me, the whole universe would collapse. So what is religion? Religion is a set of truths that we believe in. Now the next part is, La ikraha fiddin. People felt Islam was spread by the sword. Well, if that's the case, why is it still growing so fast? Fastest growing religion on this earth. Was there any swords in the United States? People are saying become Muslim or not? No. If you think about compulsion, you can force someone physically to do something. But to believe, to the, the philosophy of understanding, you can't jam it down the throat. They will still have their belief. If you look at the before the, you know, the Iron Wall fell in, in Russia, the communism fell, people were forced not to go to church, forced not to go to masjids. They had to abandon them. But do you think that worked? Now look at Russia today and people are practicing their religions. They freely can do what they want. They've never abandoned it. Yes, they can suppress it from being seen openly, 
But what's in the heart, no one can force you. So Islam is not a religion of force. It's actually a religion that's telling you, look, we're guiding, we're teaching, we're helping humanity, but at the same time, it's a religion that embraces humanity, embraces everybody. It's not even tolerant. It's forget tolerant. It's not about tolerance. It's about loving the world. Because Islam teaches us, and Allah teaches us that we need to love our neighbor. And it doesn't matter if he's Jehovah's Witness or he's Christian or Hindu, they're a brother. This is the beauty of Islam. And this verse is telling you, look, you can't jam things down people's throats, but they are still your brother. And then Allah is trying to tell you, look, be careful, because if you go on the wrong side of life, you're going to have problems. And you need me to take you out of those problems. Now this is where the conversation today is about. I don't want to do too much of a lecture because I want us to talk a little bit openly and question and answer when we finish. But there's a lot of problems in life we're all going through, all of us. Who said you're not going to be having problems on this earth? Of course you are. It's like saying, okay, go to university. I know some of you are really studying hard right now. And it could be you know, in Kitchener, or it could be in Oshawa, or it could be in Toronto, wherever you're going. And your time has been taken a lot. But can you imagine you go and go through this trial and there's no test? So what's the use? <laughs> I study all this for nothing? Of course you need to have a test. That's the trials of life. So problems are going to be there. Now, some people cannot handle problems, and that's the sad thing. And they give up hope. So I asked some of you before today's conversation is, what causes people to you know, have problems? Or what are the answers to life for these problems? So some people say, well, people are worried, they're stressed out, they're depressed, they go through a lot of problems because they easily give up. They don't have God in their lives. They easily give up. They don't know who to turn to. They turn to material, they turn to friends, they turn to family, and they, unfortunately people abandon you. So they say that's a problem. Some people say the problem is people are sinning and we have weak faith and we just have nothing. In reality, all this is in a way true. And the solution is going toward God to, for guidance and for help. Now, I, we mentioned this last week and there's a very sad thing happened two weeks ago. I know some of you have seen in my son's Facebook, but his fellow classmate, when they graduated in high school in Switzerland together, both of them came to North America, one went to the US, and one came here. And unfortunately, the one who went to the US felt alone. He felt out of place. He felt depressed. And he tried to commit suicide a year ago. And fortunately, it didn't succeed. So he went back to Switzerland. And then the parents said, okay, you're doing okay. And the son says, look, I need to go back to university. Let me go, let me go. For one year, they didn't let him go. And the sad thing is, the day they let him go, one day later, he climbs up out of his window and jumps off the eighth floor and kills himself. And when you hear stories like that, he says, my God. I mean, I wish I had the chance, I met him when I was with I wish I had the chance to talk with him. I wish I had the chance to be with him. You know, at least I want to try. And unfortunately, what happens is a lot of people go through problems, and when they come knocking on your door, I'm depressed, I'm sad, I get out of here. You're joking. You know, they don't, they don't believe it. But people are suffering. And I saw a, a program this week, it says to save a life. It's a Christian program that shows how we should go and help people. But people don't have that because if they're selfish, what's going to take them to say, you know, forget about myself, let me help this guy who needs some help. What's going to make that happen? And I know when I was a young teenager, I was a lost teenager too. I mean, I grew up in North America, came here a long time ago. I didn't know a lot the way I should. I didn't know Islam. I was ignorant. And I told you, I read this Quran and it just moved me. And I was able to come out of this darkness and I'm still struggling to catch the light. And the, I'm blessed because I have brothers and sisters like you who were there for me. You know, I know you may not believe me, but you don't realize when I see you, you inspire me. I see, I told you, some of you have come from such long distances. Some of you have such troubles in life. I know some people are looking for work and jobs, but they still look, you know what? I'm ready to volunteer. I'm ready to help. Some of you are getting married. And they say, you know what? I'm getting married, but it doesn't matter. 
I need to be in helping the youth. I need to care for people. And I said, that's fantastic. So, when we go through your problems, and I'll ask you guys this question. When you go through problems, what do your parents say? Don't worry. It's going to be okay. Right? They give you a little pat on the shoulder. Don't worry. Be happy. You know, I just told this to Muhammad, but... You know, every time I heard this, uh, this composition by Bob McFerrin, Don't Worry, Be Happy. It's actually a, a powerful psychological effect on people. It has helped so many people. Now, what's funny is, this sentence, Don't Worry, Be Happy, is originally from a guy named, they call him Meher Baba. He was um, an Indian-Iranian mystic, and his real name was Merwan Sharar Irani. I think they put the Iran because his family was from Iran. <laughs> anyway, the sentence from him, but this sentence psychologically helps so many people. And the reason I brought it up is I was listening to the, you know, the news and this woman calls in and says, you know what, uh, my husband is so depressed, he's suffering at work. You know, can you um, play this for him? <laughs> he says, okay, we'll play it. It's a news channel, but we're going to play it, okay. So, what in this... Com composition, anybody paid attention to the words, he says something so unique. And I never listened to the words until like two weeks ago, because you know, you always hear, don't worry, be happy, you don't hear the other parts. It's saying something so deep, pay attention to what he says. He said, in every life, you will have trouble. But, when you worry, you make it double. So don't worry, be happy. So what is he saying? When you start worrying, and you start panicking, you're going to make your troubles worse. It's not going to help you. It's like when you're swimming and you say, oh my God, I'm drowning, you start panicking, what's going to happen? You're going to drown. So, it's quite deep, but this small com composition helps so many people. Now, now you go into the Quran, it's okay. You can say people have nice advice to people, but don't worry, it's fine. I'm like, what is going to make me happy? How do I know how to become happy? Is it material? I can tell you, and I've covered this when I was covering Wall Street, wealthy people are not happy. Maybe you get one out of a thousand. You know, you're lucky. Yeah, you may have your material needs solved, but are you spiritual? Do you have peace? Do you have tranquility? Do you have God? Tough question. Anyway, there's an ayah, chapter 9, verse 126. Allah says, Do they not see that they are tried once or twice a year. Yet, they do not turn to Allah, nor do they mind, nor do they think. Now, you may think problems is a terrible thing. And when we suffer, teenagers, oh, you know, they, they have their desires and they want to get married, they want to have children, they want you know, a mate. They want to do well in school, and they fall, they take one year of, say they want, they want to be doctors. The first year they fail. Oh my God, you know, they give up hope. No, you cannot give up hope. Sometimes the problems are waking you up and say, look, take another way, or try harder, you know, get up and be even stronger. Whatever doesn't kill you will make you stronger, right? Come on. There's another ayat of Quran, chapter 25, verse 20. And we have made some of you a trial for others. Will you bear patiently? And your Lord is ever seeing. Some people say, man, that's a nice thing. My friend is a burden. He's <laughs> a big trial on me. Or my, my mom, or my brother, or my sister, or my headache, my wife, you know, my children. No, it's a blessing. When you're going through that tough exam, you know you're in a higher level. Can you imagine those who had the toughest exams? was the Prophet, Ahlul Bayt, the companions of the prophets, the companions of Ahlul Bayt. You know, if you look at what happened to the Prophet of Islam, children were throwing rocks at him, people tried to kill him, they killed his family, I mean, the troubles and tribulations, what happened to Imam Zain Karbala? They massacred his family. Did he give up hope in God? No, he said, Allah, I love you. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for giving me the chance to see even more. And if you look at people in this world, when they go through the shocks, sometimes they wake up. And if you look at, I remember in Bosnia in 1993, there was a big war in Yugoslavia. And we met many Bosnians and who were irreligious. They didn't, they didn't practice. 
But when the troubles and tribulations started, they started to practice. They started to pray, and they started feeling tranquility and happiness amongst the suffering. So suffering is not that bad, as you may think. And I'll give you an example. My brother-in-law, when he was 14, they were in India, and they were not Muslims at the time. And they were a wealthy family, and they lost everything. They were so wealthy, but a big storm happened, and something happened. Everything, their factories, everything. Everything lost, everything. They had nothing. And then they found Islam. And then they found Ahlul Bayt. And today you look at him, this guy is the nicest guy. This guy is so happy. With all the trials and tribulations he's going through, he says, Alhamdulillah. This is what the trials does for us, the problems do for us. It wakes us up. So it's a blessing in disguise. And forgetting God is the problem of life. Because when you forget God, and you say, you know, I'm busy with my exams, and I'm busy with my job, and I'm busy with my wife, and career, and husband, and children, and, and we forget God, then the trials and tribulations start really paining us. Then we start feeling it. And the solution is, think of God. Remember Him. And when you remember Him, He will remember you. And He's the best of helpers. So, happiness comes from these trials when you turn to God, when you have faith. And it, it's okay because God is always with us. Now I wanted to get to a little bit of what Ahl Bayt have taught us. So now I've given you a nice synopsis of a psychological experience and examples. But what does the Ahl Bayt tell us? What are the solutions? What does the Quran tell us? What's the answers? Imam Ali has said in Najib Allah, Allahumma sari ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says, O creatures, of the Lord, and he's talking about us. I advise you to be God conscious. Taqillah, have taqwa. Remember God. Have Him in your life all the time. Be with Him. Talk, talk to Him. You know, some people say I have to be like formal with Him. Of course not. Talk to Him. I remember we used to hear about the, the helpers of Ahlul Bayt, the people who worked around. They were talking to God all the time. Talking, you know, like a relationship. We met one lady who converted to Islam in the camp. And she says, you know, I never knew I can talk to God like that. But you know what? I cried to God. I said, God, help me. I'm worried about my daughter. And she was like a 10-year-old daughter. And you're worried about every, any child. And God just made her feel so much better. She read the Quran. And she felt, and you can go on YouTube, you can see it. She was so happy. And after that experience, because of her relationship of talking to God, we need to talk to God. And Imam Ali is continuing to say, I advise you to adopt piety. You should have God consciousness. We need to have that. If we're like a lost soul, and we're just thinking of drinking and clubbing, and you know, just going crazy. I was speaking to one brother from a masjid on the block. He said 99% of all the youth are all drinking, all doing drugs, all doing anything haram you can think of. Even worse than the average non-Muslim. He says, what the hell? What's going on? He says, I went in the car with them, and everybody had a can of beer with them, in the car, driving. I said, let me get out of here. He said, what's happened to the world? Yes, they're from war-torn countries, maybe, or they're from troubled families, or they're from problems or tribulations, but you don't turn to the bottom. You turn to the one who made this universe. He's the one who's going to help you, not the guy who's going to drag you down to the dirt. And so a lot of people are going to sorrows, and they get going to drugs. And I told you an example of the person who committed suicide. You know, they actually went, ended up getting into drugs as well. I mean, it happens. So Imam is saying, piety is the safest way for salvation and your best support in your religion, your being, your way of life. Keep yourself attached to it. Never forsake it. It shall lead you to places of safety, to positions of honor, pursuits, bringing you peace and contentment. You want peace? You want happiness in life? That's all we want. Then Allah is going to give it to you. You're not going to get it from the dollar bill. It won't last. You don't even have dollar bills here. You have like loonies and toonies, right? But it's not, you're not going to get it from that, okay? You're going to get it from Allah. Imam Ali continued, Piety will act as your shield against all your problems in your life. And a defense and in the, in the life, and in the hereafter, you'll be a guide to heaven. It always, 
it, its ways are clear and simple. Those of you who espouse it will benefit by it. And one who is imposing it upon themselves will be guarding against the world. It will guard, guard you. It will protect you. So God consciousness, being aware of God, being with God, loving God, having Him as your center point in your life. I know in Tawaf we think of the Kaaba as your center point, that you're doing this Tawaf and, and when you go to Hajj. For our lives, in this world that we're going around, if you have Allah in your life, when you're taking an exam, you say, oh man, I didn't study hard enough, but I'm going to try my best. When your father is ill in the hospital and you're sad, you say, Allah, I know we're from you and we're going back to you, but relieve him. If you're going to take him, Alhamdulillah, no problem. But if you're going to keep him alive, make him comfort, comfortable. Let him not feel the suffering and pain that he's going through. So Allah says, وَلِبَاسُ تَقُ اللَّهِ Sorry, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. وَلِبَاسَ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ الْخَيْرَ Sorry, my Arabic is terrible. Allah says, but the best clothing, libas, is taqwa, is God consciousness, is remembering God. And that clothing of having God with you, protecting you, helping you, is greater than anything else. So, moral wretchedness starts with examples of jealousy. When you see someone else, oh man, I want what they have. Oh Allah, take away from them, give them to me. Hatred, revenge, fault finding, wrath, prejudice, greed, egotism, arrogance, fear, temptation. These are all psychological diseases because people are insecure. They, they don't have God in their lives. Well, Imam Ali continues to certainly piety is the medicine of your hearts. How do you cure those psychological diseases? I know when I was young, I had terrible anger management problems. Still not cured, but inshallah, I was getting cured. <laughs> At least we're trying, right? But how did it help? What changed me? I, I'm telling you, I read the Quran and I felt my heart was being put in a washing machine and cleansed and washed. And I felt my morality changing, my behavior changing. The way I talked to my mother, I just was different. And you get that from Islam. The care and love you give to humanity, you get that from God. He gives you that. Imam Ali says, sight for the blindness of your spirits, that's what piety will give you. Cure of the ailments of your body, it's the rectifier of the evils of your chest, the purifier of the pollution of your minds, the light of the darkness of your eyes, the consolidation for the fear of your heart, and the brightness for the gloom of your ignorance. Now, you may say all this sounds great that you want to achieve piety, but give me an example. How do I do that? Well, the first thing is Allah says, Well, a dhikr akbar, the greatest of remembrances of God, is salat. Now, salat is the, the backbone of our faith, it's our connection with God. You know, if you ever watched that movie, How to E.T. Phone Home, you know, our phone home to, to God is salat. How do we communicate with Him? How do we talk to Him? It's through dua and salat. Imam Hussein, and we're talking about Sayyidina Fatima Zahra, Allahumma Sharaq, Allahumma Nawari. He used to say, well, I used to often witness my mother absorbed in prayer from dusk to dawn. You know, we barely even wake up for Fajr, right? But from dusk to dawn, she's just remembering God and crying to God. And she has so much love and and veneration for God, and tremendous uh, awareness of God. We are, we forget God, we only call Him when we need Him. Oh Allah, I'm going to take a test right now, can you help me? After the test, hey, let's go to the bar and have a drink, you know? Come on, <laughs> what happened? It's a sad world. The scholars of ethics have defined what the problem is. What happened? Why do we act like this? If you covered, remember last time we talked about egotism. We, we thought we can get rid of that. No, it's come back. Our ego is the cause of most of our corruptions in our life. The root of all vices and sins, and in order to attain self refinement one must be seriously struggle against it, the jihad of nafs. We need to battle the selfish ignorance of ourselves. Now, if you look at the examples of Quran, and we can go bug the sisters. Zuleika, good example, right? <laughs> what was wrong with her? 
Look at the way Yusuf had to suffer because of her. She was the, the wife of the person that there, he was living in the house of, and they were the masters. And she had vile and wretchedness, and she went after him, and really after him. And that was the time of her life when she was a little bit not on the right path, worshiping idols, not God in her life, the one God, the creator of the universe. And she never succeeded in, her, in going after him. She never got him. She never got what she wanted. And then her husband died, and she had a sad, wretched life. But later in life, she found God. And later in life, she found the truth. And then she loved to pray. When we pray, we just like, come on, Dad, I don't want to pray anymore, come on. I don't want to go to the masjid, forget Fajr, forget Jummah, forget Salat al Layl. Salat al Layl, man, I'm sleepy. You know, we're in a total different mindset. But if you look at Zuleika's story, if you ever saw the movie Yusuf, it is so beautiful what happened to her. She was so inspired by Allah, and she got all that she wanted in life. And in the end, you know what she wanted? She wanted just Allah. She just wanted to be one with God. But she got everything that she needed and wanted in life. She even got her youth back. You know, her beauty and the light of, of the world was on her. Because she was so pious. That's her example. Yeah, we could be on the wrong path. You know, it happens. We make a mistake. I told you I'm a teenager, a lost kid. But Allah takes you and says, wait a second, come to me. Where have you been? I'm here. We're, we're calling you. You don't hear me? Sometimes you have a problem or tribulation. It's like a pinch. You wake up, you know? Yeah. That's what life is about. Like, okay, you can't find a job. Okay, you don't do well in a course. You know, you have a problem with calculus or, you know, I don't know what you guys suffer from. Physics? I don't know. Some of you are English. Anyway. So, we have two selves. Within us, we have two selves. We have the animal self and the human self. Now, the human self consists of our spirit. This is the part that most of the earth today have abandoned. They went after the material self, and they forget this. There is no balance. There's no moderation. It's extremism. They call Muslims extreme. No, wait a second. Maybe the extreme, yeah, the extreme in terms of having a gold car in Dubai, yeah, that's extreme. <laughs> that's extreme. But to, to have God in your life, and remembering and saying, thank God it's Friday, that's not extreme. That's a blessing. So, this spirit, which is blown in, in our, they say the spirit of God is blown into us, you know, this, that's what we have, this, a life, a, lot, a human being is alive. It descends from heaven to become, for us, to become God's vicegerent, to be His Khalifa on this earth. We've been given the opportunity to be His ambassador on this earth for humanity to care and to love people and to guide people. The other day I went to uh, the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall. I was riding my bicycle and I said, hey, I always wanted to go inside. I go inside and I found Islam. So what are you talking about? He says, the next day I went to a mosque, a mosque I'd never been to, a big one. I knock at the door, closed. A few Muslims outside, they saw me and they waved and they left. When I went to the Kingdom Hall, I knocked, it was locked. A few people were leaving, but instead of leaving, they came back and said, you need something? He said, I wanted to always see this place. He said, come in. After, they realized they're not going to convert me. But at the same time, I'm not jamming it down their throat. And they realize Islam is beautiful. And so are they. They're also good people. They care. You know, okay, they may be jamming somebody, knocking at people's doors and say, hey, yo, you know this God. <laughs> How many of us even knock at our door of our friends? How are you? You know, a year ago, one brother, I got a call from a sister. And the sister says, look, you better talk to this guy. He's thinking of suicide. I said, what? This guy from our masjid that comes to our mosque? Yeah, yeah, maybe you know him, but go talk to him. And I went and I said, what's going on? And he's not, it's okay. He had financial problems. He was suffering. Tough exams. So, I mean, really hard life. And a few brothers and sisters got together and said, you know what? You have a financial problem? Yeah, here's five bucks. Here's 10 bucks, here's 100 bucks, here's 700 bucks. You know, and everybody grabbed him and said, look, we're, we love you, don't do that to yourself. And not only us, Allah's there with you. Now this guy's on fire, he's moving and he's happy. He just, you know, I, I just heard he got like 10, 5, 10,000 bucks from this, you know, scholarship from, from that. So Allah gives. But at the same time he's watching me, he says, look, when you see people in need, are you going to help them? Are you there for them or I'm there for you? 
It's, it's my fault. You know, I wasn't there for this guy. Thank God, you know, we got together and everybody said, look, God, grab this guy and tie up his hands. We're not going to let him do that. Alhamdulillah, he's okay now. But, you know, we all go through these the cycles, you know, the troughs and the peaks. That's life. But we need to be strong as Muslims. When we're in the trough, when the things are down, we can handle it. And we can get up and say, no, I'm not going to let this pull me down. I'm going to be stronger and even better next time. And if I made a mistake, Allah, please forgive me because I'm ready to come back even stronger than before. And I'm going to help. And I'm not going to abandon you again. Anyway, so to achieve happiness is through wisdom. It's through the spirit and of doing good and having benevolence and care. This is what inspires us to, for the ideals. So if we follow the animal self, and we lose control of our bodily affairs, and we lose, we don't have wisdom, then gradually we get distant from God, and we lose our human values, and falling ultimately into deep and dark valleys of ignorance. We forget our human self, and these are the meanings of egoism, egotism. When we forget humanity, and we're just wretched human beings, and we just want to cheat, we, don't, we want to rob, we want to you know, bother people, we want to harass people. You know, it's, if you ever get a chance, I really like this author, I know you guys are saying, yeah, you're old fashioned, Charles Dickens. Read his books. I'm telling you, he gives you the examples of rich and poor. I know some of you saw like Scrooge, A Christmas Carol, and how Scrooge was like greedy and evil, and then he changed when he saw reality. There's many stories like that he's written. And he's trying to show it. And he said something beautiful to Imam Hussein. I don't know if you've heard that, but Imam Hussein said, he said Imam Hussein went to Karbala, but he wasn't there going to fight because he brought his family with him. So he was there for even peaceful means. But look, they killed him. And so he was on the right. Anyway, it was fascinating that he was even knowledgeable to understand Imam Hussein. We don't even understand him anymore. So if you read his books, you'll be inspired. Says, look, I need to do good. I need to remember my human self. I need to care for humanity, people who have nothing. Today you don't see it as obvious as in the past, but it's there. So egotism is deprived of human dignity, virtues, moral perfection. And one keeps himself amused with whimsical and futile affairs such as lying and remains ignorant of God's remembrance. As another kid who committed suicide, a few weeks ago at York University, the guy who shot himself, the Hindu kid, I don't know if you heard about that. Sad thing, what he went through was, he felt that like he wanted attention, and he told his friends, um, I'm dying, you know, I'm going to be dying in a couple of weeks, so I have a disease, and all of his friends spent so much time with him, and they cared for him. A few months later, he's still alive, <laughs> what's going on here, man, what happened to you? And they found out that he was lying, and then they all left him. And that's the sad thing, because they didn't realize he was crying for attention. And he left a note, even to one Muslim. He says, I'm sorry, and he shot himself. I mean, people are in need. They, they need you who have God. I mean, we're blessed that we have Allah. We even know His name and we care for humanity. Well, don't abandon your neighbor. Okay, it's another religion. That doesn't mean anything. You are here in this earth for everybody. You're the, the caliph of this world today. You're the ambassador of God in this world. How could you abandon? You know, Prophet Isa was one of the greatest examples. He was with the sick, those who have leprosy. And he would hug them. And the blind, and the poor, and the women of the night. You know, he was with all people and cared for everybody. Prophet Muhammad even more. These are our examples. So Allah says in the Quran, أَرَأَيْتَ مَنَ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهُهُ الْهَوَىٰ have you seen those who take as for their God, their, their passions and their desires and their wants? Some of us have come to the West and say, we want to make money. That's why we're here. Well, that's your God now? In God you trust or in gold you trust, you know? Worship means humbling yourself, bowing down, submitting to His commands, absolutely without raising the least objection. Similar in the case of egotism, ego, egotist, person becomes the God. The self is becoming the idol now. And it becomes the problems of life. 
And you cannot be considered a monotheist when you worship yourself. We can't say we're Muslim and we're worshiping ourselves. There was a person named uh, Ibn al-Yafur who asked Imam Jafar Sadiq. He said, I said to Imam Jafar Sadiq, we love this world. We like this world. What do we do with its wealth? He said, it's a good question. Said, I mean, I like this world, don't you? It's not a piece of crap. I mean, yeah, you have problems, but you don't give up hope. It's a beautiful world. Look at the, you know, the fruits that come out. You say, look at the beautiful colors. And your family and your children and your friends. It's beautiful. And the bro relationship, brother and sisterhood that we have here. It's beautiful. So he's asking about Jafar Sadiq. He said, I love this. I like this world. What do I do with the wealth? So Imam Jafar Sadiq replies, I replied, by means of this wealth, I'm sorry, let me repeat it. He says, I like this world. Imam Jafar said, what do you do with your wealth? And he says, I replied, by means of this wealth, I get married. I go to Hajj. I take care of genuine family expenses and expenses. I help my poor brothers and sisters by giving alms and for the sake of God. And Imam Jafar said, said look, you're not worldly. This is Akhirah. This is God. This is the truth, what you're doing. This is not worldly and materialistic person. This is what your life should be. So we think that working, getting a job is all you know, dunya, dunya, dunya. No, no. That's Akhirah. Because if you're doing it to support your family, feed your mother, take care of the poor, helping humanity, it's a tool for the goal of getting nearer to God. Imam Ali has said, Pious persons are going to be well rewarded in the next world, as well as this world. They did not jeopardize their salvation like worldly-minded people. Now, we living in the West, we see people, it's all greed, money, power, success. It's all about the dollar bill. They want to get to the billion dollar level. They want to get into the IPO of Facebook this week. You know, they want to make money and everything is about who cares about everybody else. Well, the pious person, the righteous person has both. And they've achieved success in this life and the next. They enjoyed the bliss of this world as much as the tyrants and the bad people of this world. They've enjoyed this world. And that's Najibullah, that's letter number 27. Therefore, working as an employee, as some of you are doing, or some of you are trying to do, or find a job, being involved in a business is actually achieving nearness to God. Now, you don't use it as your goal in life, but it's a tool in life. And Imam has also said, Imam Ali says, get away from me, this world. Imam is talking to this world. And he says, your reign is on your own shoulders as I have released myself from your ditches. Remove myself from your snares and avoided walking into the slippery places. And you may say, well, he abandoned this world. No, he was with the people. He wasn't a monk worshiping in a, in a mountain. Of course not. He was working, making money to help his family, making money to feed the poor, making money to care. He used to plant date palm trees, plus he was the caliph of the time. And he would give away his wealth and help humanity. Allah says, there are those who buy the life of this world for the hereafter. And the one who works only for this world will join the worldly group, the dunya type people. Now I remember when I was... Um, you know, working my last job, there was an intern who came to work with us. It was my client's son. And I was remembering him because yesterday he got married in Chicago. And he was so stressed out, so distraught. And I said, what's going on? And he says, look, I'm in the University of Michigan. This was, I was in New York. He said, I'm in the University of Michigan. I'm doing well. I have a 4.0 average, but I don't want to be, stay there. I don't want to be there. I want to be in New York with my family. I want to go to Columbia University. I said, did you apply? He said, yeah, I applied four or five times. They keep rejecting me. But the kid is smart. You know, very intelligent guy. I said, I'm going to give you a secret. You'll get in. And he says, what? I said, pray. I said, ah, get out of here. I said, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I said, pray and you will see a miracle. I'm telling you. He said, I'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. But I'm saying, turn to God. Let me tell you. I am witness. It was August. He said, the deadline is passed. September is school. I'm never going to get in. I said, try, even as a non-articulate, transfer student, something. 
And he said, I'm not going to make it. I passed the deadline for the applications. I said, it doesn't matter. You have God with you. Go. He took his application, did his essay, went, handed it in, and he prayed that day. I'm telling you, he prayed. The next day they said, okay, you're in. He said, what? <laughs> I'm in? He says, you're in. He came to me and he was like in tears. I says, my God, I think you're right. You have something here. It's not me who has something here. We have something here. We need to turn to God. He's never abandoned us. How could he deny you something good that's good for you? Okay, some people wish for a million bucks. Yeah, but maybe you soon get a million bucks, you forget God, you forget humanity, you forget everything. That happens to us. You know, we get lost. So he's protecting us from our problems. If you look at Malcolm X's story, I know we love reading his book by Alex Haley or watching a movie, but look what happened to him. He was filled with problems in his life. And when he was at the trough, when he was in jail, when he had nothing, when he had been abandoned, and you know, what happened to his father was lynched in Michigan, I think, or wherever he was, and what he suffered from racism and problems, and you know, he got caught with the wrong friends, and he got caught robbing uh, somebody's house, and went to jail. In jail, he found a lot. And in jail, he went on his knees and he prayed. And you look at that man today, we respect him because he fought for the rights, uh, for civil rights. He fought for justice, just with his words, so eloquent. You know, people hated him at the time. But today we say, this is the guy who was inspiring. What inspired him, what kept him strong and that he's fearless, is having that Allah in his life, God in his life. Now, a lot of you have heard of a story of a guy named Bashir Hafi. This is the story where Imam Musa al was passing by someone's house and he heard a lot of craziness going on in somebody's house. And they were sinning and all this haram stuff going on in this house. And I think one of the servants went out to throw out the trash and Imam Musa al says, Do you know if the owner of this house is a free man or a servant? She was like, that's a weird question. <laughs> and she said, he said, oh, well, he's a free man. He said, of course he's a free man. As well as a master, replied the maid. He says, oh, oh, you're right. Because if he was a servant, he must have been afraid of his master and should not have been committing such sins. So if he was a servant, servant of the, the one God, he would have never done those things. He would have never heard of people and all this crazy stuff. When the maid came back in, the, the, the guy says, what happened? Where, what took you so long? Yeah, somebody asked me a strange question. And he went running outside and he said, I know who it is. We went out barefoot and to found him on Musa al and says, Forgive me, I've messed up in life. I always thought, you know, stupidity. Forgive me. Ask Allah to forgive me. And after that man, after that time, this person became so pious. Just like I gave an example of Malcolm X. Just an example of people you see every day. They just accepted Islam, they accepted the truth, and they woke up. Other examples, Imam Jafar Sadiq was once asked about someone in Kufa. This person's really wealthy, successful, you know, part of the empire, you know, and he's really lost. What advice do you give him? He said, just stop sinning. Quit the sinning. Quit the things that are bad for you. Some people say, well, I enjoy the sinning. You don't realize, you take a drink, it's killing you. You're hurting your body, your mind, and your soul. And then people around you. You don't know about the domestic violence that happens in this world. And a lot of it's alcoholic related. You don't realize how much evil happens in this world. You know, they look at most crimes, it's because of drink. You know that? Most crime, most of the people in jail, why they went there, they, they were all intoxicated. Majority <laughs> intoxicated. It's so dangerous. So avoid the sinning. Some people say, look, I live in the West, come on. No. You live in the West, you've got to teach them what's the truth and guide them. So one time I was in New York and I met a guy in the masjid. And he was so happy. He was, you know, was really like, excited. You know, he was a convert, a revert. And I'll give you his name as... Um, I don't want to give you his name, but I'll say, okay, his name was Sharif. Okay, Sharif. So I asked him, I said, what happened to you? He's always happy, you know. He says, look, you don't know me. I was in the military. And when I came back, the world abandoned me. I had nothing. I became homeless. I was in the streets. And I don't want to tell you what I was doing, you know. I don't want to tell you. But he's always happy. He says, 
but I found God. I found Allah and I found Islam. And they took me in, they helped me, I cleaned up, I have a home, I have a job, I have food, and I can't thank anyone except Allah for what He's done for me. You know, this is what Islam does for us. Islam is, is conscientious, it's an act of submission to the Creator. You know, if you look at, um, there's a blind brother who was unable to see, who came to the camp, in Muhammad Ayyub. He was saying that there are a few principles of life that are going through tough things for us because on one level, and if you look at the, what happened to, for example, the Prophet Adam, you have the, your, your divine goal from God to be the ambassador of God on this earth. You know, you have to do this. But at the other end, you have your nafs, you have your desires that's pulling you. So some of you say, look, I'm going to university, you know, I want to get a good career, I want to get a good intelligence. And the first thing you do is, you know, some brother walks by or some sister walks by, you're like, oh my God, and you lose your akhra and dunya and everything, you know. So it happens. You're, you can't even control ourselves that we make such mistakes. So many problems happen in life. We have to be tough. We have to be strong. So Allah says in Surah Al-Shams, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَاشْ سَوَّاهَا فَالْحَمَهَا فَجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَهَا مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Allah says, And the soul, and him who made it perfect, and he inspired it to understand right and wrong. You have been inspired innately by Allah, what's good and bad, in your soul. But successful is the one who purifies it, and indeed the one who fails is the one who corrupts it. You want to have problems, you want to have suffering, then corrupt yourself with this worldly problems of the diseases of this world, and you will fail. If you hang out with your friends playing basketball, and then they say, you know what, have a, a, I don't know, have a whiff of this joint or whatever you, they say these days, or have a smoke, or have you know, a drink, or pop a pill, he says, no, I don't do that. I know in Canada they're doing these beautiful things of raising money for the heart. And sometimes they may tell you to do things you don't believe in, you don't want to do. You know, something an Islamic. You have to say, look, I don't do this. I don't. And this is my faith, this is who I am. And if you don't like it, back off, okay? I don't care. And if they bother you, just get a note from your parents. You know, they'll say, okay, you don't have to do this project or this thing. In the end of the day, what the story of Prophet Adam and what happened to Shaitan and his selfishness and his arrogance and his nafs that went wrong to Shaitan and then he tried to bother, you know, so much Prophet Adam, that's still happening to us today. But you are the ambassadors of God. If you think about it, you found Allah. You're with Him. You're one with Him. Now you need to move. So we don't look at the Prophet going back 1400 years ago and think about him then. Take him and bring him to you now. He says, okay, what will the Prophet do when I'm in this situation? If I'm depressed, if the Prophet is in the same situation I am now, how would he act? Would he give up hope? Would he abandon God? No. What would he do? He would get up and become stronger. He falls down, stands up again. 